God. The eliminating modules of God. You learn Sanskrit. Go back to your scriptures. Go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. Division in Islam is prohibited. We understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Quran is the most positive book. Every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted in India after they identified that they're females. According to the statutes of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice, 2,730 women are being raped every day. Every 32 seconds, one woman is being raped. I've been raped in U.S. until the time I'm here. Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Of the West. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? The concept of jihad. Who are terrorists? Who marry more than one wife. They are labeled as terrorists, fundamentalists, who spread the religion with the sword. These few misconceptions at the back of their mind will prevent them from accepting the beauty of Islam. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. My dear brothers and sisters, respected elders, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I am honoured and privileged to welcome on behalf of the Common Centre Management Committee, Brother Dr. Zakir Naik, the world famous scholar in Quran and comparative religions. Also, I welcome him to Bradford. May I inform him that we are proud to call Bradford Little Pakistan or the curry center of the world. Indeed, I feel we are blessed to be in the company and to be guided by his proper knowledge of Islam at this testing time for Muslims and non-Muslims alike in Britain. Brother Zakir must have received many accolades in his lifetime, but the one that to me is the most fitting a description that I have read of him, calling him Ahmad Didat Plus. At this time, may we all take this opportunity to make dua for Brother Ahmad Didat, who passed away yesterday. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him Jannah. Ameen. Also, I must congratulate Islam Bradford for organizing this event. The young people who have organized the event and seeing them at work at first hand has made me proud of their endeavor and hard work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for their efforts. Last but not least, I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he opens our hearts and minds so that we can take full benefit from Dr. Zakir Naik's lecture. Jazakallah khair. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The talk is titled Islam Misconceptions, which of course is a very relevant title, especially in this day and age. So there are many misconceptions regarding Islam from both Muslims and non-Muslims. So alhamdulillah, we've invited Dr. Zakir Naik to shed some light on some of these misconceptions. To give some background about Dr. Zakir Naik, he is from Mumbai in India. He's a medical doctor by professional training and he's an international orator. He's well known throughout the world, delivered hundreds of lectures on all continents. The format of the talk will be Dr. Zakir Naik will speak for approximately one hour and then there will be questions and answers. The questions for the brothers will be taken on the roving mic and the questions from the sisters will be taken on paper only. So if the sisters have any questions, then please write them and pass them to the brothers. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Al Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma bad. Auzu billahi min shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbi ka bilikma. Wal ma'azit al hasna. Wajadun billati hasan. Rabbi shahli sadri. Wa yisilli amri. Wa halul ugdata min lisani yafkahu kawli. My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of 
This evening's talk is Misconceptions About Islam. And it's a pleasure for me to be once again back in Bradford. I'd been here twice before. Last time in the year 2002 and in 1999, just for a short charity dinner. And Alhamdulillah, I'm happy to be back again with the people of Bradford. As I'm aware, it's called as the Pakistan of UK. Someone wrote Bradistan. <laughs> Today, inshallah, we'll discuss misconceptions about Islam. It is the duty of every Muslim that he should convey the message of Islam, the religion of truth and peace, to all who are not aware of it. It is compulsory, it is fard. There are various different methodologies of how to convey the message of Islam to the others. Some are less effective, while the others, they are more effective. One of the common strategies used by most of the Muslims is that they speak a hundred good points about Islam to the non-Muslim. Even if that non-Muslim agrees with all the hundred points you have mentioned about Islam, yet at the back of his mind, he will think, ah, you are the same Muslim who is a terrorist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who is a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the person who marries for women. Ah, you are the people who spread the religion with the sword. These few negative points at the back of his mind will prevent him from accepting the beauty of Islam. What I prefer, whenever I meet a non-Muslim, I ask him up front, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable. You can speak against Islam, you can criticize Islam. I make him comfortable. You can ask any questions. What do you feel is wrong with Islam? And after making him comfortable and at ease, that non-Muslim may ask about three or four questions. And in the experience that I have for the past more than a decade, I have realized there are 20 most common questions that a non-Muslim may pose. And when he asks three or four questions, invariably it falls amongst these 20 most common questions. So if the Muslims memorize and know the answer to these 20 most common questions, with quotation from the Quran, Hadith, and the other religious scriptures of the non-Muslim, with reason, logic, and science, even if he cannot make the non-Muslim accept Islam, at least he can neutralize the animosity that the non-Muslim may have against Islam. How have these 20 most common questions come in the mind of the non-Muslim? It is depending upon how the media portrays Islam. And today, we find that there is a virulent propaganda about Islam in the international media. The international media is bombarding people with misinformation about Islam. When we read the international newspapers, the international magazines, on the international radio broadcast stations, on the international satellite channels, we find that they are giving misinformation about Islam. It's the duty of every Muslim that we should clarify this misconception. And depending upon how the media portrays Islam, this set of 20 common questions will change. A few decades earlier, this set of 20 common questions were different. Maybe in the next couple of decades, it will again change. Depending upon how the media portrays Islam, this set of 20 common questions keep on changing. And Alhamdulillah, I have traveled to different parts of the world, whether it be USA, Canada, UK, Singapore, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, India. These 20 common questions are the same. There may be one or two additional questions based on the surrounding of that area, but the remaining 20 common questions are the same. Time may not permit me to discuss all the replies to these 20 common questions due to the limitation of time. I'll try and cover at least half. 
inshallah. However, you can go to the website www.irf.net where I've written a book, replies to the common questions asked by non-Muslims. Today, the most common misconception asked by the non-Muslim about Islam, especially after 9-11, is that Muslims, they are fundamentalist, they are extremist, they are terrorist. In my original book, which I wrote before 11 September, this was number four and number five. Now it has come on the top of the charts. We Muslims are labeled as fundamentalist. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who strictly follows the fundamentals of one particular subject or one particular field. For example, if a mathematician has to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of mathematics. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of mathematics, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a scientist, to be a good scientist, he should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. We cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. For example, if we have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, he is bad for the society. On the other hand, if we have a fundamentalist doctor who saves thousands of human lives, he is good for the society. We cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I am concerned, I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know, I follow and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be a few fundamentals of Islam which the non-Muslim may feel is against humanity, but the moment we give them the background, why these fundamentals are there in Islam, the reason and the logic to it, and the statistics, there is not a single human being who is unbiased who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity. That's the reason I say I'm proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. When we read the Webster Dictionary, it says that the word fundamentalism was first used to describe a group of American Protestant Christians in the early part of the 20th century this group of Protestant Christians, they protested against the church. The Christian church, they believed that the message of the Bible is from God. This group of American Protestants, they said, not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If anyone can prove that the Bible is the word of God, this movement of fundamentalism, it is a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that the Bible is not the word of God, then this movement is not a good movement. But this word, fundamentalism, was first used to describe a group of American Protestant Christians. When we refer to the Oxford Dictionary, it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. But when we refer to the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there's a slight change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of a religion, especially Islam. The word Islam has been added in the revised edition. The moment you think of a Muslim, he has to be a fundamentalist. He has to be an extremist. I tell the people, I am proud to be an extremist. I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely just, I'm extremely honest. What's wrong in being extremely kind, extremely just, extremely honest? I'm an extremist Muslim. The Quran teaches us 
Allah's Kalam, the last and final testament of Almighty God. It says that every Muslim should be extremely kind, extremely just, extremely honest, extremely merciful, extremely loving. What's wrong? What's wrong in me an extremist? But we should be extremists in the right direction. We find on the media, you know, the Muslim, the extremist. I said, yes, I'm an extremist Muslim. Extremist Muslim. Not any other extremist. I'm an extremist Muslim. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 171, Do not commit excesses in your religion. Committing excesses is wrong. But going to an extreme, as long as it is in the right direction, it is good for humanity. We should not be extremely unkind, extremely unjust, extremely dishonest, extremely violent. We should be an extremist in the right direction. The problem with us Muslims today is after the media is attacking, we have become apologetic. Oh, you know, I'm not a fundamentalist. You know, I'm not an extremist. We go on the defense. Why? Why do we go on the defense? And we find, especially after 9-11, Many of the Muslims, they have changed the attitude, they have become so apologetic. Why? We have the deen of haq with us, the religion of truth, which is the religion of peace also. Muslims are labeled as terrorists. No Muslim should ever terrorize a single human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. It is not allowed in Islam that we should terrorize any innocent human being. Many a time, Two different labels are used for the same activity of that same individual. For example, the country where I come from, India, more than 60, 70 years before, we were ruled by the British government, by the Britishers. Many Indians, they were fighting for their freedom. These people, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But the common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they had no right to rule over us, then you would call these people as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. And such examples you can give, in human history, several examples. For example, we know about the American Revolution, which took place in the 18th century. 1776, they got the freedom. Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But the same people, Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, by the common Americans, they were called as heroes as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. Later on, this very terrorist, George Washington, becomes the president of USA. Imagine a terrorist becoming the president of one of the most advanced country today in the world, America. And he sets an example to all the future presidents to come including George Bush today. His hero is who? George Washington. He was called a terrorist by this government. Imagine. All the presidents, they look up to George Washington. Who was a terrorist? And now, we find that both the countries are the best of friends. Imagine. <laughs> Therefore, before you give a particular label, to any person, you have to first try and find out for what reason, for what cause is the person striving. We have the example of Nelson Mandela. Before South Africa got its freedom, previously it was ruled by the white apartheid government. They called Nelson Mandela as a terrorist and they arrested him and they imprisoned him in Robben Islands for more than 25 years. Later on he's released and he becomes the president of the new South Africa. And later on he gets the Nobel Prize for peace. Imagine, the ex-terrorist is getting the Nobel Prize for peace. <laughs> Therefore, before agreeing with anything, first we have to check up. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 6, whenever you get information, check it up before you pass it on to the third person. Check up the information. Why is the person calling him for Is it the fact? Is it right? It may be right. It may not be right. 
I am not saying that all the people who are labeled terrorists are good human beings. They may be good, they may be bad. They may actually be terrorists who have been terrorizing innocent human beings. But before we agree with any information, we have to first check up whether that information is right or wrong. That is the duty of every human being, whether he's Muslim or non-Muslim. The second most common misconception regarding Islam is regarding the word jihad. Not only non-Muslims, but there's misconception even amongst the Muslims. Non-Muslims as well as Muslims think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for property, whether it be for region, whether it be for language, it is called as jihad. Any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be personal gain, property, fame, region, it is not called as jihad. <laughs> jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In Islamic context, it means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to improve the society. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in self-defense in the battlefield. Jihad also means to fight against oppression. Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student is striving and struggling to pass the examination, in Arabic we'll say that he is doing jihad. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. Many people, non-Muslims as well as Muslims, they have a misconception that jihad can only be done by Muslims. There are several verses in the Quran which point out that even non-Muslims did jihad. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them, and in pain did she give them birth. It's saying that all the human beings should be kind to the parents, especially the mother. Immediately the next verse says, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 15, but if your parents do jihad, strive and struggle, to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of whom you have no knowledge, then don't obey them. But yet, live with them with love and compassion. Here Quran is saying that when the non-Muslim parents, they force their children to do shirk, worship somebody else besides the true almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then don't obey them, but yet live with them with love and companionship. Quran repeats this message in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 8. We have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. But if the parents do jihad, strive and struggle to make them worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't obey them, but yet live with them with love and compassion. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 76, the believers, they fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The unbelievers, they fight in the way of the Satan. Here Quran is talking about jihad fi sabilillah, which is right, and jihad fi sabilil shaitan. If you strive in the way of the evil, it is called as jihad fi sabilil shaitan. So there are various types of jihad. But if jihad is mentioned alone, it is taken for granted. In most of the cases, it is jihad fi sabilillah, unless it is specified. Otherwise, it is understood that when a Muslim uses the word jihad, it is understood it is jihad fi sabilillah, unless it is specified, depending upon the context. The other misconception regarding this word jihad is that it is usually translated not only by the non-Muslims but even by so-called Muslim scholars as holy war. This word holy war was initially used to describe the crusades. The Christians in the name of the religion, they killed thousands of human beings. These crusades were described as holy war and today that word is used for jihad. When the Orientalists use this word, holy war, for jihad, unfortunately, some of the so-called Muslim scholars, inverted commas, even they translate jihad as holy war. In Arabic, 
the word for holy war is harbum muqaddasa the word harbum muqaddasa is nowhere to be found anywhere in the quran neither it is found anywhere in any hadith of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam jihad basically means to strive and to struggle what we should do we should strive and struggle against our own inclination we should strive and struggle in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should strive and struggle to follow the guidance allah has given us in the quran and according to me one of the important forms of jihad today is dawa is conveying the message of islam to those who are unaware of it the third common misconception today is the religion of islam was spread by the sword islam comes from the word salam which means peace it's also derived from the arabic word salm which means to submit your will to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in short islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to almighty god to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if you translate islam was spread by the sword it means peace was spread by the sword it is rather contradicting peace was spread by the sword and if we analyze every country in the world it has a police force this police force it uses violence sometimes against the anti social elements to maintain peace in that country this police force its job is to use force or violence against the anti social elements so that peace will prevail in the country similarly in islam it's a religion of peace it's a religion that spreads peace but as a last resort if there are certain anti social elements who are trying to create corruption in the land trying to create mischief in the land violence can be used as a last resort to maintain peace in the world and the reply to this allegation that islam was spread by the sword is very well given by a famous historian by the name of delacy o'leary he writes in the book islam at the crossroad on page number 8 he writes history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical muslims sweeping across the world forcing islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic absurd myth that historians have ever repeated the legend of muslims sweeping across the world forcing islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic absurd myth that historians have ever repeated we muslims we ruled spain for about 800 years later on the crusaders came they wiped out the muslims there was not a single muslim who could openly give the adhan we muslims we have been the lord of the arab lands for the past 1400 years for a few years the britishers came for a few years the french came but overall we have been the master the lord of the arab land for the past 1400 years yet today there are more than 14 million arabs who are coptic christians coptic christian means Christians since generations, these 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. We Muslims ruled India for more than a thousand years. Today, more than 80 percent of the Indians they are non-Muslims. These more than 80 percent non-Muslims in India, they are giving shahada that Islam was inspired by the sword. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim to accept Islam as the point of the sword, but we didn't do it. Islam does not permit us to do that. These more than 80 percent, 800 million non-Muslims in India, they are bearing witness. They are giving shahada that Islam was inspired by the sword. Today, the country which has the maximum number of Muslims, Indonesia, more than 200 million Muslims. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia, which has more than 50 percent Muslims? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? It is the sword of the intellect. As Thomas Carlyle, the famous historian, he writes in his book Heroes and Hero Worship, according to him, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is his hero number one. That yes, we have to get the sword. Where will a person get a sword? Initially, every idea originates in one man's head. In one human being, it lives alone. It will little good that it picks up a sword and propagates it. He has to first find the sword. Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sword of the intellect. 
as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, the ayah I started my talk with. Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah, wal mu'azit al hasna, wajadun billati ahsan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them, and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. There was an article that came in Eater Digest Almanac Yearbook, 1984, which was repeated in the Plain Truth magazine. It gave the statistics of the increase in the major world religions in a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984. And number one maximum increase in percentage was Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I'm asking the question, which war took place between 1934 and 1984 in the span of 50 years, which forced the non-Muslim to accept Islam? Which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I'm asking, who is forcing these Americans to accept Islam at the point of the sword. Who is forcing the Europeans, the Britishers, to accept Islam at the point of the sword? And do you know, the media always says that the women in Islam are subjugated. Do you know, amongst those people accepting Islam, whether it be in America or Europe, or any part of the world, two-thirds of them are women. If Islam subjugates the women, then why will the American women accept Islam? Why will the European women accept Islam? Because they know that Islam has the solution to the problem of humankind. And whatever the media does, I believe in the verse of the Quran, as Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 54, Allah khairul makreen. They planned and plotted, Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planners. Salman Rushdi, a citizen of this country, born in my city, Bombay, citizen of this country, he wrote a book, Satanic Verses Against Islam, Against the Prophet. Act is wrong, it should be condemned. Net result, many non-Muslims want to read what is the Satanic Verses. They read the Quran and many of them accepted Islam. Intention was wrong, act was wrong, end result, Wallahu khairul makreen. Allah the best of planners. What happened on 11th of September? World Trade Center, more than 5,000 human beings were killed. Innocent. It is wrong. Act has to be condemned. The media had a hype against the Muslims, war on terror. People don't know that what is this religion? Quran became one of the best sellers in USA. And according to a report in the span of 9 to 10 months, 34,000 Americans accepted Islam. According to Johan Ridley, in the span of 10 months in Europe, 22,000 Europeans accepted Islam. Normally, it should be the opposite that, you know, dawah should go down. Alhamdulillah. How much the media is trying to suppress Islam and malign Islam? Alhamdulillah, the tables have been turned over. Alhamdulillah. We Muslims should not be apologetic. We should speak the truth. We should stand for truth. We should propagate this religion of peace. And Allah gives a promise in no less than three different places. Allah says in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. And Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. Huwa lazi arthala rasoola wa biluda wa deen al-haq liyu zhira wa ala deen kulli. Malaw qari al-mushrikoon. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, over all the other ways of life. However much the mushrik don't like it. And Allah repeats the message in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. All the other isms. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah does not require you and me to make his deen prevail. The rubbish that we are, Allah does not require you and me. Allah himself is sufficient. Allah doesn't require us. Allah has given us the opportunity to make here while the sun is shining. Do you think that if we don't speak about Islam, Islam will not spread? Do you think Islam is spreading because we are doing dawah? Believe me, wallah, we Muslims are not doing our job. What is happening is because of Allah, we don't at all get the credit. We don't get the credit. We aren't conveying the message according to me. We aren't. 
We are afraid to open our mouth to speak the truth. So Allah is telling in these verses, this deen is going to prevail with or without you, with or without me. The rubbish that we are. He is giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit reward. And I would like to end this answer of this misconception with a quotation from Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said, people worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. The fourth common question asked by the non-Muslim is, why does Islam permit a man to have more than one wife? Before 11 September, this was question number one. Now it has gone down the charts. <laughs> question number four. But yet it is there. It is there in the top 20s. <laughs> Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which says marry only one. There is no other religious scripture where they read the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Bible, the Mahabharat, the Ramayan, Bhagavad Gita. No religious scripture on the face of the earth except the Quran says marry only one. If you read the Hindu scriptures, Ramayan, the father of Ram, King Dashrat, he had more than one wife. If you read Mahabharat, Shri Krishna, how many wives he had? Four, ten, thousand. He had 16,108 wives. Shri Krishna can have 16,108 wives. So why can't we Muslim maximum have four? <laughs> if you read the Old Testament, Abraham, peace be upon him, he had three wives. Solomon, peace be upon him, he had 700 wives. So according to the Jewish and the Christian scriptures, you can marry as many women as you wish. There's no upper limit, 10, 20, 1000, 10,000, no upper limit. It is the Christian church which has put a restriction that Christians should marry only one. It is the Jewish chief rabbi, Genshem ben Yehuda, who passed a synoid in 950 to 1030 CE. He passed a synoid that Jew should only marry one woman. And if we observe in the Sephardic Jewish community, which lived among the Muslims, till as late as 1950, they married more than one woman. Similarly, according to the Hindu scriptures, Christian scripture, Jewish scripture, you can marry as many as you wish. Even Hindu scripture, it is the Indian government which has passed a law in 1954 known as Hindu Special Marriage Act, which says a Hindu can marry only one. But the scriptures give them permission to marry as many as they wish. And when we refer to a report by the government on status of women in Islam on page number 66, 67, it says that the polygamous marriages done by the Muslims in India in a span of 10 years from 1951 to 1961 is 4.31%. And Hindus in the same span, 1951 to 1961, 5.06%. So Hindus are 0.75% three-fourth percent more than the Muslims. Though the Indian government does not give permission yet, they do more polygamous marriages than the Muslims. Let's analyze what does the Quran have to say. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number three, marry women of your choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. This statement that if you can't do justice, marry only one, is only given in the Quran and no other religious scripture. You can marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. And Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 129, that you cannot do justice between your wives, but do not turn away from them altogether. That means difficult. Therefore, marrying more than one wife in Islam is not compulsory for many people think marrying four wives is for <laughs> It is optional. You can, it gives you permission, maximum up to four. But if you marry more than one wife, and if you can't do justice between them, then you're in problem. Let's analyze what are the logical reasons why Islam has given permission for some men to have more than one wife. By nature, male and female are born in equal proportion. But medical science tells us today 
that the female child can fight the germs and the diseases better than the male child. That's the reason there are more deaths among the male children as compared to female children. You ask any pediatrician and he will testify to you that the female child medically is a stronger sex, can fight the germs and diseases better than the male child. So in the pediatric age itself, there are more females as compared to males. As life goes on, there is death due to cigarette smoking, due to drug addiction, due to alcoholism, due to accidents, due to war. There are more males dying as compared to females. The longevity of lifespan of a female is more than the male. So today in the world, there are more females as compared to males. Except in a few third world countries like India, etc. The female population is less than the male population and the major reason is because of female infanticide. According to a BBC report, there was a report by the name of Emily Beckinen in the program assignment, the title was Let Her Die. She says that every day in India, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they are females. If you multiply this figure by 365, every year more than a million fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they are females. And according to the Tamil Nadu government hospital report, out of 10 females born alive, 4 are put to death. If you top this evil practice of female feticide and female infanticide, even in India, within a few decades, the female population will outnumber the male population. In New York alone, there are 1 million females more than males. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million females more than males. In UK alone, in this very country of yours, there are 4 million females more than males. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females more than males. And Allah alone knows how many millions of females are more than the males throughout the world. Suppose I agree with the non-Muslims that one man should only have one wife. And suppose my sister happens to live in USA or happens to live in Britain, in UK, and the market is saturated. Or suppose you are living here. If the market is saturated, and you have a sister, your market is saturated, every man has found a woman for himself. Yet there will be 4 million females in this very country who will not have life partners. So only option remaining for my sister, Alhamdulillah she happens to live in India, she's not living here, it's only a hypothetical question. <laughs> if she happens to live here in UK and the market is saturated, or your sister is living here and the market is saturated, Every man has found a woman for himself. The only option remaining for her is that she either marries a man who already has a wife or become public property. Public property? Brother Zakir, such a harsh word. I say it is the most sophisticated word I can use. I cannot think of a better word. People normally take offense. What do you mean public property? I said that is the most sophisticated word I can use. There is no better word I can use. In America, the strategies they tell us a person, before he settles down with a life partner, he has eight different sexual life partners on average before he settles down with one. Some may have three, some may have four, some may have ten, some may have twenty. And after settling down, how many has? That's not mentioned in the statistics. But before he settles down with a permanent life partner, he has eight different sexual partners. There, in the Western countries, even here, even in America, having mistresses, 5, 10, 20, no problem. Having more than one, having two legal wives doesn't go down the throat. When a lady is mistress, she doesn't have rights. She is dishonored. She doesn't have facilities. In Islam, when a woman becomes the second wife, she gets equal rights. She gets honor. She gets grace. But this does not go down the throat very well. Polygyny, a man being permitted to marry more than one wife, is actually for both. It is even to maintain the modesty of the woman. And I'm very frank with you. I do agree that no woman under normal circumstances would ever like to share her husband. We have to agree. Let's be honest with that. Under normal circumstances, no woman would ever like to share a husband. But the Islamic Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. A true Muslimah, a true Muslim woman who knows this, she would not mind 
bearing a small loss of sharing a husband to prevent a big loss that is another Muslim sister becoming a public property. So she's letting a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. We have to be frank, no woman would like to share a husband. But a good Muslim is willing to let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. The next question that can come, question number five, if Islam allows a man to have more than one wife, why doesn't Islam allow a woman to have more than one husband? But naturally, the start sheet itself tells us that if this is allowed, then the proportion will go more haywire. But the main answer is that if a man has more than one wife, and if a child is born, you can easily identify who the mother is and who the father is. But if a woman has more than one husband, if she has two husbands, and if a child is born, you can identify the mother, but you will not be able to identify the father. So if he goes for admission to school, and if the column is there, what's the name of the father, maybe we'll have to mention two names. <laughs> and today, psychologists tell us that if you do not know the name of your parents, any one of them or both of them, the child has a very bad childhood. That's the reason the children of prostitutes, etc. I mean, they have very bad childhood. I, being as a medical doctor, I'm aware today the technology has improved. There is DNA testing by which there are high possibilities where you can come to know who the father or who the mother is. But that came into existence recently. Even if you agree, it is 100% accurate. Islam is there since time immemorial. And this is not the only reason. There are various other reasons. For example, man is more polygamous in nature than the woman. A man, biologically, can do a role of multiple husbands as compared to a woman doing a role of multiple wives. Because of the menstrual cycle she undergoes, the change in the psychology, etc., that's the reason Hadith says that during a menstrual cycle you have to be kind to your wife and you can't do many things, you can't do divorce, etc., you know? Because, you know, imagine in this situation, if she's a wife of more than one man, for her to do the role of wife is more difficult. And furthermore, today science tells us that if a woman has more than one sexual partner, and even if all of them are loyal to one another, there are high possibilities of sexually transmitted disease emerging in the woman and being transmitted back to the man, which is not the case in man. If a man has more than one sexual partner and all of them are loyal to one another, then this doesn't happen. This is medical science. So Allah in his divine wisdom knows that's the reason I mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 24. Do not marry the woman who's already married. I'm sorry,